Yeah, so my name's Sean Hampton from the uh, from the Met Office, and I'm just going to go through some of the things that we've learned whilst um, playing around with continuous delivery. Um, so the intention of this presentation really is to demonstrate what actually um, continuous delivery looks like. Because if you go through on the internet, have a look through, do a Google search, what you'll probably find is a lot of Wikipedia-style entries, um, people describing continuous delivery as it comes out of the books. But what you'll if you're lucky, you might find a technical person who's put their own, um, their own shell scripts, their own plugins, third-party apps, written a bit of a blog on it. But what you'll very rarely find is to see it, is a kind of see it, touch it, taste it, feel it kind of what continuous app delivery actually looks like. And the kind of, not pains you go through, but the things you, you don't consider when you say, yeah, I want to go down that route. So that's what we're intending to do. But um, to give you a little bit of background from what the Meta actually does, because we're not just the, the weather report you see at the end of the news, we've got additional customers, you know, such as aviation, um, we provide services for defence, um, uh, for the health services, and uh, we also you know, do a lot of climate change uh, work as well. And again, it's not just the weather reports you see that we're involved in, okay, that's the most obvious one you've, you've heard of. We also do severe weather warnings. Um, we've also got our own website and the mobile apps in our mobile website. And uh, we also get involved with some things like volcanic ash. And the reason I include this slide is because, apart from the forecast on TV and radio, the team that I work in and the software developers around us are involved in all of those aspects. So you can see it's not just the, the website and everything else you might expect, or you probably haven't heard we're doing some of these things. So to go into um, how we do release management at the Met Office, it's kind of split across two teams. You've got the configuration management team, which I'm part of, and that's our, we're the dedicated deployment team. Um, we also deal with the source control and version control management, and we deal with the build, build and continuous integration management. Um, so we're basically, if you look at the, the ITIL kind of stuff, we're the technical arm of release management. And then you've got the release management team, which uh, deal with more of the paperwork in the organisation, the scheduling, and uh, they're the ones that are seen by business, everyone else, so, you know, they're, they're kind of the representative there. Um, both teams, uh, we support several major products, and it's probably closer to 75 developers overall, um, when you're taking the development um, database side of that sort of thing as well. So you can see there's only about 10 of us supporting that many people, so we're quite busy. Um, so to give you kind of idea of where we came from, because you can't just open a box and start doing continuous delivery. We've come down a long and, and kind of arduous road, and the idea that we're trying to give across is that you can't just say open a box and start doing it. We've come quite a long way in, in, in the five years I've been here, um, and it, we basically started off when we started delivering our web services. We did it as a single deploy, where everything got compiled and built into one thing that we pushed out the door, all the services, all 25 of them, all bundled together. So if you made a change in one, you had to regression test everything. So ideal for us, we only had to make two or three deployments a month. Testing team hated it, release management team hated it, everything that was all linked in together didn't really work. Um, so it was decided when they moved to new infrastructure, what they were going to do is break everything down so that you could change the back end of something without changing the front end. Um, you could do one service without impacting another. Again, the testing team went up. We didn't because the amount of deployments and, and builds just went up literally overnight. For, whereas we had one build to cover everything, we then suddenly had three or four services, uh, three or four builds rather, for one service. So we'd be changing back-end stuff and front-end stuff. So the minute, the minute that came in, our capacity shrunk down. We couldn't do as much deployments as we wanted to, and we were struggling a little bit. So our builds and deployments were continuously increasing. As more and more services adopted the new approach, the numbers just went up, and they were growing at uh, ridiculous rates almost overnight. What we were doing is everything was being deployed manually. That didn't work, because again, you went for one manual deployment. You could probably get away with that, because just in a deployment window, you're making one activity. It's easy to go through that slowly, make sure you do it right. When you're having to do almost 100 deployments in two hours, your human error is going to start creeping in. So this is why we decided we had to go away from our manual deployments, which is SCPing, FTPing, files to servers. Um, our infrastructure is dark, we've got loads of redundancy and resilience, so we're having to deploy things to a number of servers. 
what we're finding is that things will go into some places right and other places incorrectly. Again, human error, um, some services will be running properly, some configuration files haven't been deployed, and it was just taking quite a long time. And for everything we had to do, we had to prepare it. Because we had then also prepare a rollback at the same time, we were doing, for every deployment, we were doing activities two or three times just to make sure if something went wrong, we had it covered. And also, um, we were constantly in the windows having to go back a couple of steps, fix something that had broken because someone had missed the server out, or that um, an incorrect version of a properties file had been deployed, um, some HTML files had been deployed at a folder level two up. Very simple errors. What we're finding is it was just really constricting our deployment windows, and everything was getting a lot very stressful very, very quickly. And I said, whenever we had to, de to prepare anything, we were preparing it as its rollback and it as deployment. So we had to start automating because we were getting to the point where even preparing it was causing errors. Someone would miss a file out of source code or something like that. So what we decided we wanted to do was semi-automate some of our stuff. Um, we basically, we got a shell script which pulled our code out of our um, build tools, out of our source control, and put it on a server, just by a simple um, shell script doing FTP and that sort of thing. Then we decided we were going to extend it a little bit more, and we were getting our deployment record, which stored all of, all of our history of deployments, to create a config file, which then controlled the shell scripts, and then pushed it out. But this is where we started hitting problems. In order to create the shell script, to create the config files, a user had to go into the deployment record, had to create the config file, then run the scripts. And you can see already, I used quite a lot of these, these animations we can see from that initial setup, where it was just very quick. So already you can see it's slowing down, there was a manual intervention there. And then what if you wanted to go to different term um, tiers? You had to run it separately for dev environments for test environments, for pre-production and production environments. So already you can see that what was a very simple process to begin with, when you start adding complexity, it grew and then every single time you wanted to start it off, there was a manual process. There's two, actually there's two years, one when you create the config and one when you tell it which tier you want to go to. So um, you're always having to wait for someone to do something and you know, you, if you've got two release managers dealing with that sort of thing, your, your capacity for releases is just continuously getting more and more constricted. What we did find is that because we were getting very constricted and our time was quite precious, when developers were asking for deployments, that often they were going a long time before they got action. So what should be happening when we deploy is that developers were asking us, we grabbed it from source control on our builds, and then we put it onto the servers and going through our deployment record. So everything was up to date, we knew where everything was, we could always roll back to a good configuration. But what we were finding is that developers would be asking, and then there'd be no response. So they sit there and go, right, I'm going to do this myself. They deploy something to the dev environment, and suddenly your, your database is right dead. If that's broken your environment, you don't know, none of the other developers know, unless someone's actually seen the dirt or they've spoken to each other. So what we were trying to do was trying to put our scripts in the middle so that they didn't have to wait for us. So we put something which we called developer auto deploy and it got shortened to dad. And what it was doing is allowed developers to use our scripts to pull the stuff out from our source control, from our uh, build servers, deploy it and record it all, all, all as uh, we normally would without getting us involved. Freed us up a little bit. But again, still a very, very manual process. You needed someone who's constantly going, I want to do this now. And, and from there, you, know, you, you can see why bottlenecks were starting to appear. So we, we took the decision. We needed to get rid of these manual processes. Um, so we had to ask ourselves, well, what actually do we need to do here? We had a couple of issues here. The first one was that um, we had to re-educate a lot of our developers. <laughs> Um, there, there's a very much a mindset in the Met Office that um, for the developers, the deployments, uh, sorry, the deployments of builds are two separate activities. In the fact that they build something, it sits there on a the server, then they ask for it to be deployed. It's not, I build it, it will get deployed. So you know, they're always asking for two things, can I have a build, can I have it deployed? 
And uh, you can see for each one of those, if we're busy, and we say we've only got a small team, if there's a load of requests out there, you'll get to them when you can. And then they wait for the build to be started. Then they wait for the deployment to take place. And you see this, how these bottlenecks are occurring. But one thing that we're trying to push through now is because we started off with this one single deployable, the mentality had always been that should build server. The, the idea of continuous integration, where you pull all various aspects in, such as unit testing, such as um, co-quality metrics, such as you know, checking for license violations, those sort of things. Kind of, it's there and we supply it, but the idea for the developers was it's a build server, it does nothing more than that. Um, so what we were trying to do is pull everything else that we'd already had in place back into the conscious of all developers and also make sure that whenever they did anything, commit code to source, it would find its way back through the build servers, back through continuous integration, eventually out onto the, uh, the development environment, so you weren't sat there having to wait for uh, requests to be action. They could basically get on with their job, and things would happen just because they were doing the job. We were getting a lot of bottlenecks because of, of these requests and everything else, so we were finding it was still very time consuming to prepare releases, because what our scripts had done is they basically automated our manual processes. We hadn't changed them. They were still the same things going on underneath, just that a script was running it, not, not us doing it manually. So whilst the, the errors we were getting with deployments, such as inaccuracies, wrong servers, wrong folders, they'd all gone away. But what we find, we're still getting these big problems with, um, with big windows. We've had to prepare big packages and their rollbacks as well. Um, because of the fact that we were deploying hundreds of the applications within small windows, it was becoming stressful. We wanted to try and make these, these deployment windows as small as possible with the reduction of stress. And also, as you saw on one of my previous slides, you had to tell it whether to go to dev, test, pre, prod, wherever. We were finding that some applications were deploying slightly differently. So you got through eight or nine of them as normal, you got to the awkward one, you'd have to go back to the notes, you were slowing down all the time. So we wanted to make sure that everything was, was as standardized as possible. And we were finding that because we were always having to click go, basically, the deployments were limited to the amount of release managers, configuration managers that actually around who could do the job. If you only had two in, you can only run two at a time because you're waiting for one or two, one or two people to start it off. And I said, we haven't really addressed some of our underlying problems. We just automated what we'd already done. So we made the decision that we were going to go down a continuous delivery type route. And um, what we did is after we took on a six month trial of, of deploy it, and um, we decided we were going to build ourselves up slowly. We'd never done continuous delivery before, so what we thought we'd do first off is just be able to get our code from build servers or source control and push them up to deploy it. What we we're also having to do is give deploy it some um, deployment instructions so that we weren't constantly having to um, create packages on the fly. So we started off manually, very slow, very small building blocks, take the code from someone we knew where we could get it, get the deployment instructions and keep that with the code. Because we found that if, if you have a business continuity issue, you've got to activate your disaster recovery plan, you're gonna bring up your, your version control, you're gonna bring up your continuous integration. At that point, you automate deployments more of a luxury than a business necessity. Yes, you want it all the time, but what we're finding is if suddenly you lose this, you've lost your deployment instructions as well. Deploy has a, has a Maven plugin, which uh, allowed us to keep the code and the deployment instructions together. So when we brought source control and version control back out, we had everything there. We could actually then take that and in the event of emergency, start deploying. We knew what we were doing. So you were taking the code and the, the deployment instructions, creating a package, pushing that to deploy it. Again, it's still very manual, but um, we were making small steps. What we then started to do was linking our source. We'd already been linking source control and our build service already, but we made the decision, started building it all properly, and then we were running code quality metrics. This is going more into continuous integration. It wasn't just the source control. It wasn't just the build server. It wasn't just just deploy it. We were pulling everything together, creating the leaks, creating the tunnels making sure that when you did one thing, it moved on to the next. So developers were still committing their code manually. They were kicking off builds manually. But now Jenkins was doing all the heavy lifting instead of us running on Maven and 
plugin or maybe command line script on, on the server itself. So Jenkins was creating the, the deploy package, but also we didn't want junk code ending up on our development environment. So we were plugging it into our code quality metrics and making sure it didn't have any bugs, making sure it was uh, bringing back good metrics, making sure you know, there wasn't any libraries in there we weren't allowed to use. We want to make sure that you don't pull stuff in and they get used to doing it straight on dev, because when you start addressing these issues higher up, you're running out of time before you've got to push stuff up to production. So what we're doing is trying to get everything sorted on Jenkins, get it doing the heavy lifting, so that everything that found its way out was um, onto dev was good code, so we could take that all away. But then we're still manually deploying it, because we're only getting used to pulling everything together. So what we've done compared to the last one is that we were uh, we're now pulling it through continuous integration, but we're clicking go inside deploy it, and then it's recording it. So we were getting there at this point. This lasted for a couple of months, got used to it, and this is the state we're at now, where a developer commits to Git. That then uh, sits there listening for changes, what Jenkins does. It runs its unit testing, it runs its code policy metrics, does everything it needs to do to ensure that that code is ready to go out. It then goes to deploy it. We store our artifacts in Artifactory, as we use it as almost as a DML. Deploy it does the deployment, of course the deployment, and also we've got Jenkins telling tech leads whether the um, code is actually good, whether there was a break, whether there's actually any issues, because we've, as I said, we, we've, we've gone from a situation where continuous integration was, wasn't seen as that, it was just seen as the build server. So what we're trying to do is whenever things were being introduced that were causing problems or had the potential to cause problems, make sure the tech leads knew about it so they could actually develop it to, to fix a call that was, that was taking too long or they included a library that shouldn't have been there and making sure things like we, we've had his, history as well where um, unit tests have been commented out to get them through the build rather than trying to, to fix it properly. So we're, we're going down this whole route of, of enforcing standards a bit more but all the developer has to do now is commit back to the source control rather than having to go in, start their build, ask for a request for deployment, wait, so they're, all they, they're basically getting continuous information back so they could just literally get on with their jobs. I'm sure you guys appreciate that what, if you want to do your job, you want as little barriers as possible. You just want to be able to get from what, do your day job and let the, kind of the rest of it take care of itself almost. So that, that's how we got to where we are now. So you can see we didn't just say one day, we want to take on continuous delivery. You, know, you see we got to the point we got to because we kept hitting problems, we kept having deployment issues, we kept having uh, a load of release managers off on holiday or someone off sick and then the release windows were getting stressed, we had a number of failed deployments. So we decided you know, that, that's how we got to where we were. But there was other things we had to deal with when we got there. Um, and one of the earlier slides, if you see, you might see we were using cruise control. That was no longer up to the task, so we decided to migrate over to Jenkins. We also, in part of this process, we've migrated from one source control tool to Git. We realized early on that the tools we were playing around with at first weren't <coughs> up to what we needed, so we had to go through that whole stage of evaluating what our tools were and making sure what we've got is up to the job. There's no point um, bringing in something like continuous delivery if the stuff you've got way back at the beginning of the process isn't going to cope with it. You need to adopt it as a completely end-to-end -end approach. And um, the tools you have got, you've got to make sure that they are, um, they're up to date. Because if you update something, if it's all integrated, if you update one at the beginning, you've got to make sure that that now talks to an older version of something else that sits in the middle, which sits something else at the end. You've got to make sure all your upgrades stay in line. Because if you upgrade, upgrade something and you don't upgrade the application it's talking to on the other end, you end up with a break in the chain and everything just stops working. So we found that upgrades were particularly fought for us because what we had to do is make sure that when we were upgrading something, we took <coughs> into account the whole chain, whereas before we could have just upgraded a single app and got away with it. We were having to plan our, our upgrades a bit better. And so the tool dependencies, you need to know what's talking to what. If something drops out, are you going to know how it's going to affect your delivery chain? If you lose your continuous integration server, obviously you lose that link from your source control to your <coughs> delivery. So these are all things that you probably don't think about when you say, I want to go down to the continuous delivery rate. You kind of start realizing as you live with it and realizing these aren't problems with it, but things that you, you need to be aware of because you've never had these issues before. 
One thing we found particularly um, interesting as a challenge was um, when you come to testing your new, or you actually upgrade continuous delivery tool, and then you, um, you get to test it. That's loaded with your live data. You've got a test system that's loaded with live data connected to your live servers. If you're fortunate enough and you've got a separate test system, you can connect it to that, but then you need to re-import your data. So you need to be careful when you're testing a continuous, in, a continuous delivery tool because you, are, you could potentially deploy to live environments. That's also, if you're testing your connections to prod servers, can you do that? Depending on the, the top size of your organization, you may be allowed to go onto the production server and just connect and make sure it's okay. But if you're in an organization the size of the Met Office with the sort of standards that we've got, with, uh, with uh, terms of our release management and everything else, we we're actually not allowed to connect to production servers outside of release windows. So all these testing things have little complications that again you don't think of when, when you originally start playing around with it. And then when you did the releases themselves, that's what you think about when you've got continuous delivery. You think, yes, I want to be able to take my release, shorten it down, make it a lot less stressful, make sure that we can deliver on time, we can deliver in full, we can do all that sort of thing. But what about anything you recorded previously? Everything before continuous delivery, you may still need to update those services at some point. Unless you're in a fortunate position when you're deploying to a brand new set of servers, you're going to have a history of deployments. You've got to keep that somewhere. And then also, you've got to know how long do you keep that for? If your continuous delivery is recording its delivery, or it will be recording its deployments as it goes, you've got to at some point say, when do we get rid of the old um, deployments? Because there could be something you need to change in six months' time that's been living on that box and hasn't been uh, deployed for nearly a year. You need to make that decision of when you, you're happy to uh, stop or stop using your old records. And the other thing is that we we found is possible is a challenge. It might just be the way that we work is um, because we changed our source control. We originally were deployed from source control, which also included binaries, which didn't really work, but we managed to, to get it to work. We need to put in place somewhere to store all of our um, all of our deployments. Again, business continuity type reasons. If you lose your automated deployment server, you've lost all your deployments. You need somewhere else that you can record, you can manually go and grab those in the, in the event of an emergency. So we had to put in place uh, some sort of um, digital media library. So those are more of our technical challenges we had and the things you don't normally think about. But then when you bring in something like Deploy that's got continuous delivery, you're changing the whole culture of the way you work. And the key to that is getting people on board and making them know what's happening. Um, and this is probably the one that we've had more problems with because we understand the technical nature. It's the communication and making sure you've got those 75 developers plus all the support teams plus oh, and even to some extent the customers know that you're changing the way you're working. Um, so constant communication is key. I mean, the way ours, ours has sprung up is that we've actually been working in conjunction with the developers because we're changing the continuous integration tool because we're changing the source control and, and we're ultimately changing the way that they work because they don't have to keep emailing us saying, can you deploy this? Can you build this? So that, that was um, one thing that we just had to constantly work at is letting them know the new way of working is this. Then, it's, I'm not sure if this is a unique challenge to us, but something we found is that when we started using um, continuous delivery, we found that um, developers thought the way they tell us about changing their deployment instructions is updating a wiki page and not telling anyone else. So that's all well and good if you're manually doing it. You go to the wiki page, you read the instructions, you follow them. But if they're embedded in the code, they're not updating it in the right place. So what we were finding is they were updating the, the, the deployment instructions, but they were doing it on a wiki page. That's, we had to try and get them to change well, there was two things. We had to get them to update the code to tell them this is how you deploy it now. And the second one was, is why are you continuously changing the way you're deploying? There's, there's an underlying issue there. If you don't understand the, the middle way you're deploying to, or something's happened, those reasons for changing the deployment structures weren't coming back to us. So yeah, it's all about changing habits, really. Um, one of the things I said about using continuous integration instead of just calling it the build server, Things like the uh, unit testing, there have been a couple of examples where people thought it was easy to just comment it out and leave it. 
obviously that's not the way to do it. Um, but it's things like if you're getting license violations, if you're getting low quality metrics, if you're getting um, integration tests that were connected to a dev server that was no longer there, those sort of things, they were just saying, that's fine, it, it will work when it gets up there. So we're trying to make it more complete and everyone has to know the tools are there for a reason. They're not just there because we chose to put them there. They, they are there to help, they are there to improve. And one thing we did find is that when we put um, deploy in place, the developers didn't necessarily understand or know what it did. Um, so they were still trying to deploy to dev themselves and then they were coming out to saying why, why isn't this working? Because they hadn't made the connection to us having this new deployment tool and then not needing to deploy themselves or even email us. Or, so it was just constantly us having to tell people what changed, why we changed, um, and it's just the, those sort of communication type problems. But um, yeah, so as you work through slowly, you realize these things, you, you wouldn't think that you've got to maybe tell people to stop working the way they're working. Most people say, we've got this new tool, use it. You don't necessarily think to tell them, this has changed the way you work. Uh, one thing we've not been very good at in the past, um, maybe because of the tools we were using, was that we were never really worked in, in true agile ways where you're working on multiple releases at once. That's come in um, a lot more with the change of tools, and we found that it's, it's a more unique challenge because you've got multiple developers now trying to share the same environments, and because things are being deployed out, if someone builds off one branch, that gets deployed out, whereas if someone builds out on another branch, that could also deploy out to dev. You've got to work out which one's got priority, if, if anyone has a tool, and also you've got to find a way of letting developers know what's being deployed where, because there's no good two of you saying, oh, my stuff deployed, but it's not there, because someone else is coming with an older branch or a newer branch, and effectively wiped out your changes. So it's just that whole management of the way you used to work doesn't necessarily relate to the way you're going to work in future. But one thing we found, and it doesn't really matter what tool you put in place for this, if you spell test with three T's and put it in a config file, you're gonna break something. So um, you gotta make sure that if something is working all the way up because it's referencing a specific database, you get to production, it doesn't work. You need to make sure there's validation on the input you're, you're working on. And uh, so even if you've got the right mechanisms place, you're putting wildcards in to, uh, to for input validation, those sort of things, then you get, let's say someone puts three T's in test, it, it's not gonna work no matter what you do. So you need to make sure that you are um, looking at these things. So it's again, it's nothing that's wrong with the way of doing it, it's just something you don't think about when you're, you're dealing with it, because normally if you, you find a config file that's, that's incorrect, you change it, and then make sure it works from there. But if, if you're using um, a way of stringing it all together, you need to make sure that, that works every time. And um, so as I said, that's where we are. And at the moment, we're only really going to, to de development with it uh, from uh, to dev and development commit. What we are using is we're using it all the way up through the stack as a manual as a manual trigger, because our release and testing teams have control of the environments. So um, we really would like to fully adopt continuous delivery, and you know, I, in an ideal sort of way, it'd be when the testers, at the moment, the testers tell us when they want things on their environment. It would be almost triggered through um, through tickets and through bug fixes when things are when things actually go through a certain state. Maybe that could trigger something off inside. Um, so whenever anyone changes the state, saying this is ready for test, it's a trigger that goes off, and then suddenly, you know, there's no one asking for deployments. Because what we were finding as well is because of the way we string services together in a release, is that we would ha often have a day where we've got to do almost mini releases, push everything to test, push everything to pre-prod. In an ideal sort of world, what you get is um, the developers coding, saying that's ready for test. That then triggers it off to a test deployment. Testers finishing their test there, saying, yeah, ready, that's finalized, pushing up for final acceptance <coughs> testing. So that, that sort of area wants to go much more automation, so there's less people coming to us saying, we want this deployed. Um, and then automated functional testing, you know, making sure that when something gets deployed to the right environment, the right automation is kicked off, the right testing is done, 
so that you're not just sat there constantly waiting for someone, possibly not in, involved in development or, um, or, or deployment, clicking a button for automated testing to start, and making sure that integration tests as well, the things that when you deploy things to the right environments, they are doing the right checks. Again, you're cutting down the amount of manual effort of having to go into each release. One thing that we are tr starting to try and push a little bit more on is making sure the code is good enough even before it goes to dev. There seems to be a, an idea that it's just dev, it doesn't matter, that's always broken. It should be that whenever you deploy anything to any environment, it should be almost production quality the minute it first time goes out the door to anywhere. Um, we said we're still trying, we're still in the process of migrating fully, but we're still having to prepare rollbacks almost for, for pretty much every release. One thing we want to try and get on top of, if it hits an error, it rolls back automatically, so we're not sat there with a broken environment for 20 minutes. I mean, particularly some of our systems, I mean, the ones that issue uh, severe weather warnings, you don't want those to have outages at all. So if it hits an error, it should be rolling back straight away. Um, that's one thing we want to try and work off. And again, I come back to changing the culture. The tool's done a lot, and now it's down to us to do the rest. You know, making sure that when, when certain things happen, they, they hit triggers so that we're not often having to sit there action email saying, can you please deploy this? Can you please test that? And trusting the deployment as well is another thing that, would, that is a bit, of a bit of a challenge because they've gone from knowing if I put that there via FTP, that will work, to going, if I commit that, it will eventually find its way back out through a black box. So it's just trying to engage that trust, making sure people know when they do the right things, the right things will happen. And we want to remove the manual steps. I said a lot of our releases are very resource intensive. They take up a lot of our capacity. We ideally would like to be able to say, go now and off it goes, schedule it, and not have to be as involved. Because we've had some releases, it's taking two men out of a five man team. You're already then starting to hit capacity issues. So we're looking at trying to remove all of our manual steps. So this is a uh, kind of bringing it all back to a point now is what has continuous delivery already brought us? I mean, I've talked a lot about things you need to be aware of when going to it because say, it's not just open a box and go with it because it doesn't just fit into an environment like that. You need to put a bit of thought into it. So it's already freed us up a bit. Like I said, we're a small team um, and now we can do much more deployments. We can do much more with the day job now because we're not constantly having to react to emails saying, can you please deploy this? Can you please build that? And, and those sorts of things. So it, it's definitely freed us up a lot more. It's allowed us to take on more projects, which in turn has allowed more projects to get on board with these benefits. So um, yeah, that, that's, that's definitely one thing that's given us. It's increased our deployment accuracy. We're having far less failed deployments. Our deployment windows are shrinking as a result because we're not having to spend half the time dealing with errors. We're not having to stop, fix it, restart again. So the deployments are getting shorter and shorter, which of course then reduces the outages. And then um, there's less stress. So we're not sat there constantly running around trying to find the tech lead or try and find the DBA or try and find someone who can speak to the customer telling them that the service is down. We can basically just sit there, get on with it. And then we're not sat there constantly trying to work out what's happening next and who we to speak to. It's increased our reaction times. Um, we're able now, if the problem's detected, we're able to turn it around much more quickly. Because we're not preparing massive releases, because we're not preparing massive amounts of rollbacks, everything's automated. The minute that a problem is discovered, we can start reacting to it straight away and we can get them out much, much faster. So we're not preparing rollbacks. We're taking less time to actually deploy and package the releases and put them through our processes. Um, and this one thing that we found is now the same build is used across the entire estate. Whereas before, what we were doing is we were building something, then we realized that was for dev, we rebuild it for dev, we build it for test. Particularly around, we found we've adopted Maven uh, quite recently. Things that when we were releasing that from Snapshot, we were causing problems there because the Snapshot was living on different tiers and they weren't matching up exactly. So you build it once now, it comes out of Jenkins, and you can then use that build, that same file across all the tiers. And we found that's increased a lot of our accuracy as well. But the one thing that we found that, that's made it a lot easier is if we've got quite a lot of projects, and what we tend to do is rotate around the team so everyone gets a flavor of those projects. 
not one project that's the same deployment strategy across everything. You've got some apps which involve databases being stopped, some apps which don't require anything, some you know, vary this service stopped, that service stopped. What we've been able to do with continuous delivery now is just be able to say, go deploy. And then every, everyone in the team knows how to do that. It's just a case of setting it up. So you need someone who knows what they're doing to set up the initial build. Yes, you might lose a little bit in knowing what goes click under the bonnet, but then at least you can say, I can deploy it. I'm the only one in. It's after hours. I can click start and this will go. So it's, it's got to that point where you know, we all can do the same sort of things. And it, it's made our, um, made our problems a lot easier because you don't have to wait for one person to be in who knows how to deploy it. You can just say, we need this to go. It goes because everyone knows how to get that going now. So those are the benefits that we have been getting from continuous delivery. And you can see where we came from, why we had to go down this route, and uh, also you know, what we kind of all the back doors and all the um, you know, halfway houses we kind of had to meet along the way. Uh, yeah. So is there any questions? Um, just to be honest, where does security testing fit in? Um, it does, but because of the fact that we, we break everything down to such small teams, it's not handled by us per se, but um, everything gets deployed to a test environment and then the various testing teams kick in and, and do their bits. So um, I don't know about the automation and security testing, that, that it is another team that deal with that. We are basically the team that deploys, we are the team that builds and other testing teams that come in. But yes, there is testing. Um, when things go to test, it's all going automatically now, so that when it's there, the testing teams know they can do their bit. Oh. Uh, you mentioned that you went from a single deployable to multiple yeah. services. Uh, how are you using the tools to track the, uh, the versions of the uh, services? Uh, you need to have consistent sets of versions going through the environments. Yeah. Um, again, to repeat, it was going from that single deployable to multiple deployables. How are we tracking that through all the different um, tiers? What we did when we first broke that down is we, it was a basic um, access database we created. And we basically stored every single deployment and we broke it down through versions. Originally, we started using ants with version those. Now we're using mavens, we use that embedded versioning. Um, we still use a database to record, so basically everything's grouped together in releases. So you have like, uh, it's not monthly, but for the sake of argument, it'd be, you know, we know what goes into the January releases. That's version 123 of application XYZ, so we track it all that way. Yes. What would you say is the greatest barrier to organization-wide adoption of continuous delivery? Uh, the greatest barrier to adoption uh, continues to do across the whole organization. I would say that we've, the problem we've had is first been technical because we've had to change a lot of the tools and we're going through a massive tool refresh. That's probably been our biggest technical challenge, but the biggest challenge overall is, um, is getting people, um, is the communication get people on board, trusting that, that deployment and changing the way they're working. Up until we adopted um, Deploy It, we were just scripting the same manual processes we always did. So it, it's changing in, in the way you're working, being flexible. We're, we're a support team, so we've learned to be very reactive to things. Whereas um, so in, then getting the business on side saying we've changed the way of the deploy, they obviously get a bit jumpy at that because everything worked before, bringing something new in. They see it, it's they basically they, they get the information filtered. When there's a release, they've been told it's being successful. What they haven't been told is that there's been database administrators running from one end of the building to the other, trying to find various different people. So it's just making sure that getting that trust is probably the biggest thing. Hello. So you, so you mentioned uh, databases being involved in deployments. Yes. And also having to prepare rollbacks yeah. should the worst happen. So I was curious to, to find out about the mechanism that you've used to facilitate roll, rolling back of the failed deployment. Database. Oh, there's some um, rollbacks and failed deployments of databases. If I'm completely honest, um, we, we originally wanted rollback scripts as part of our deployments. Um, that hasn't happened. A lot of times we have to roll back a database, it's grabbing the person who wrote it and uh, having to make sure that it's, it's um, been rolled back properly, they even have to manually edit it. It's not brilliant, 
but databases is probably the thing we do still need to work on the most. Um, we put a lot of vigor around checking the database stuff has worked. And because of the way our systems hang together, the database is always fast. So we're able to ascertain if it's going to be a problem or not. Um, we have started um, running a lot more quality checks around the development of it, because we know we haven't got that much checks around the deployment of it. Um, database is probably our weakness when it comes to deployments, but um, you can use database deployments for uh, using deploy it. We haven't tried that yet, because we're still trying to um, improve our database uh, component. Fortunately, they only, they only tend to come up once in a while, but that will genuinely be if something's going to break, it will be there, because we haven't historically had the, the right rigor there, and now we're freeing capacity, where we're zeroing on the, the bigger problems, such as database problems. Hello. Um, so it's time taken for a new build from development all the way to production compared to where we used to be and where we are now. Uh, when developers, it always would be, we, we tend to always still be the last to know when the deployment needs to go. Um, so the first trigger we'll get is the development, development team asking for a new repository or a new version or a new build, something like that. So that's usually our first trigger. But what we're finding is that um, with, with the manual approach or the scripted approach, is that we were deploying something, it would then go, then be tested by the developer on dev after we wait for the email. You then have to wait for testing to say, yes, it'll go to test, check all that, and it goes up to the various tiers, goes through all the kind of business um, approval, everything like that. For the quickest of emergency releases, we have been able to turn them around inside a day, um, depending on how urgent it is, really. But with this new approach, you're already halfway down the, the track before you've even before you've even needed to be involved. So what we've got is we've got a uh, build setup where we use the uh, so we're using Git. So we, the development branch has a build always on it. So they commit to the development branch that's already found its way up to date. The developer has checked their change and it will work even before anyone's had to get involved. So whilst release management are off trying to get the right approvals and schedule it, you know, we're already halfway down towards getting in. So they already know it works. So it's hard to put a time on it because we, we react differently depending on what the issue is. But it has sped it up in the fact that we don't need to be involved to trigger that anymore. As soon as the, the tech lead and developer knows the problem, they've already started the fix and it, it's already on its way. Uh, so by the time we get involved, the first thing we have to do is the testers say they're ready to test it. So it's, we can react to that rather than having to go through a step of setting it up, getting it ready, preparing it, deploy it, check it for the bug. That's already happened in the background. So you know, we are skipping about a third of the whole development process about that just because they were able to do it on their own backs and off their own steam. Um, you've got 75 developers and they're all working on their own. They've all yeah. got their own software their own builds. Yeah. How do you enforce sort of standards across uh, in terms of like how, how they configure their builds and how they how those work and how they run their tests and, and how they configure their Jenkins? Um, how do you enforce that they do it in a in a in a standard way that's compliant and is of a of a, of a level that, that the company is happy with? Um, the question was about uh, standardising to make sure all developers have the same standards. Um, they. We set up as the CM team, we set up all Jenkins builds. So they, they have to, um, so there's a, always a development branch going, so that was always the same. If they need to create a new uh, build off a branch, then, then we set that up. But we also enforce that nothing gets, this one problem we had before we had automation uh, was that developers would build something locally, think that works, drop it in the dev, that works. Then when we try rebuilding it, it was failing. So we have a very simple policy, it's got to go through Jenkins if it doesn't. If it fails there, it doesn't go anywhere. So the the de developers don't own the process of, of, of configuring the build no. of their software or this, the CM itself. team own the we're, we're we're in charge of supporting the source control, continuous integration, and the automation deployment. So we own that process from the minute code gets committed to the source control, we're in it all the way up to the minute it goes out to prod. So the only thing we don't get involved in is the desktop setup. So the the ideas. They set, them, they set their own up, 
then they, they commit its source control from that point on. If it doesn't hit our metrics, it doesn't go anywhere. So if it fails, it's, it's not in the release. So yeah, most people would say, uh, most organizations in there have kind of the dev development teams are in charge of the continuous integration. We've taken that away. It's one of less additional admin responsibility for the developers. They can then um, just get on with their data. That's what they want to be doing. So we've, we've taken that admin, that admin feature away. That's what for them, one less barrier. They just basically commit their code, it's found its way out through. So we, we streamlined it from their end. Okay, we've taken a little bit extra on. But what we've done is we've ensured that there is one standard across everything else, whilst making it easier for other people. Do, do you lose something there in that the developers um, aren't able to, well, because they have the most knowledge about the software they've just written yeah. there, but they have, uh, so they, that, that might provide some value as to, to they have not it. only like how, how to configure that, that particular build, but also like if that, that's, if that way of doing it is the best way and whether that could be advanced. Yeah, we better. tend not to have that many complicated, most of it's, it, if, most of it is actually run off the command line Maven type things. So we're not really doing anything that that's overly complex, but we've got a few things like we're taking on JavaScript minification, um, and the developers have had a big hand in, in helping us set that up. Once the environment is set up and the process is intact, they want to change that, they've got to come back to us. So that we, then, the, the, we ensure, uh, uh, most thing we do is ensure there is a clean build environment that doesn't change, and if it does change, it's, got, it's all done through a match process. Because what we didn't want was people logging in, downloading a new plugin, installing a new library, that sort of thing, because obviously you're changing the build for everyone. So um, the fact that we say we use Maven quite a lot, runs off the command line mostly, we tend not to have lots of those problems, but if we do have something new that comes along, they have a big hand in helping us set it up. Um, another thing that's coming on is like building a mobile apps. We don't really know that off, off yet. But we've got a developer who's, who's doing that. He's talking us through it. We're building it up slowly. When that goes into continuous integration, if he wants that changed, he'll come back to us. Yeah, so again, we take that that additional admin off of a developer and make sure it's a clean, continuous, uh, controlled <laughs> build environment for everyone else. So we kind of we do take on a little bit extra by doing that, but we ensure it's continuous, it's, it's staying as it is, it's clean and controlled. Um, yeah. Uh, the question was about infrastructure changes part of the list. Um, again, because of the web breaks down, we don't do infrastructure changes. Um, that's all done through the release management team, who then organise people through um, uh, our uh, CMDB things like that, so they, they action other teams. So we don't do any infrastructure changes ourselves. Your code deployment depends on those infrastructure. That's managed within the CMDB relationships. So the release management team have those um, have knowledge of those <coughs> those interactions, and they'll know to uh, organize the implementation for that to go fast. So it's not done within any of the tools I've shown here. It's done within the, the CMDB for the whole so organization. Not at the moment, no. Um, we've currently got to go just to dev because, say, a lot of our, our stuff is triggered by um, uh, other teams. Want the like, testing team wants it deployed to test. That's when it gets deployed. Um, in an ideal situation, what we want to work to is that we use other tools such as our CMDB, such as uh, you know code tracking tools, things like Jira, things like that. As soon as something goes through a certain step, when that step is triggered, that's when it will kick something off. So that would be the sort of thing. So in, in the, your example of the infrastructure change, it would be that there would be a work order of change, something like that, within the CMDB that's, that's raised. When that's closed, there'll be a relationship there to kick off the next bit. But so we're, we're still very early days. We're just working on pretty much, they commit code to dev, sorry, to the source control, and it finds its way up to dev. And then we're using that tool to say, now I'll push to test, now I'll push to pre. But all that kind of interaction is managed by the release management team, not by the tools as such yet. But that's one thing that we would like to do. But it's we're still very much walking before we can run um, because uh, we've adopted a whole new way of working. So that would be a, a very much a long-term goal, and that's ideally what you'd want. But we're still very, very small way down this path yet. Yes. You said that one of your reasons for success was the cultural change. 
maybe employ. Can you give us some tangible things that you were doing in order to make that happen? Um, a lot of it was because a lot of the tools changed around the same time, so there was a lot of communication. Um, and it, it, a, lot of this was, a lot of this was driven by the developers. So they wanted to change in the source control, they wanted uh, a few other tools brought in. And then whilst we were changing our things, we saw the opportunity to plug in. So we were quite opportunistic, really. We had an opportunity to, to, to put it in and change processes. At the same time, a lot of other things were changing. So we took it on board there, but so we work quite closely with our release management teams uh, and our testing teams, and they, they were seeing the benefits. So um, from the developers, well, we pretty much told them it's less things for you to bring asking, less delays, and then they've adopted it fairly quickly from there. But so most of it was quite opportunistic, but it was a case of we, we knew what the benefits were, and we just kept shouting the benefits. You know, this will increase your employment issues. This will mean you don't have to wait ages for us to do things. Ultimately, as well, you don't have to do any deployments yourself. It's what they were doing today. So you know, we're just shouting the benefits, really. And we we work quite close with our development teams, um, so they're always over us. We're always in the same meetings. So because we work quite closely, we made it quite easy. Quite easy. But I can imagine if you're in one half of the building, they're in another. You're going to have more difficulty. But it's the benefits. If you keep saying about what the benefits are going to bring you, they they will get on board with it because they know it's making analysis. It's one less barrier as well. Because as everyone knows, the more barriers you've got to do in your own job, that's like you try and scale it around and you take the path of least resistance. If the path of least resistance is just committing stuff to source code, a source control rather, then it is it's always going to be a winner. But yeah, it's just the benefits of it are, are outweighing any potential problems you might have where a deployment might fail the first time. So you might spend ten minutes at someone's desk working out to deploy it then you probably might not see them again for another six weeks because it's doing it all automatically. Yep. Um, I have to know about the environment, so you can't do manual deployment. Um, we've been, well, so historically, what's happened is because it's been delayed, um, the, the passwords have been changed, and then um, we get one tech lead or someone higher up going, I need to deploy it quite quickly. They get hold of the password spreadsheet, and that just finds its way out to everyone. So what we did is we, we, we getting the, the path the, the environments locked down is obviously one thing, permissions or passwords, those sort of things. But what we also found was um, that as you kind of educate them that if you don't need to make a deployment, it's one less thing for them to do. It stopped happening. But it was kind of more of a not not getting people to stop doing it, it's trying to educate them in this way's better. You don't need to do something. But yeah, locking down. I mean, most of our um, servers are Linux, so it's quite easy with passwords and um, and uh, permissions and, and things like that. Uh, what does uh, deploy it, for instance, say for other folks using, say, shell scripts and Jenkins? Um, the, well, the shell scripts we used required manual intervention, so we'd have to um, create the package, which is grabbing it from source control then pushing it up to a stage your server, then from there. So you've got at least two manual interactions there, it was slow. Um, you were then copying things from one server to another, rather than just taking it from the build server across, it's all part of one move. So what we found is it's reduced the number of manual steps required, and also it's copying the same artifact across for, as part of the build. So if it fails as part of the deployment, if it can't, create, can't connect to the server, your build's failed, rather than your build working, then your manual steps failing. So you can see straight away if you've got a problem. So it's less <coughs> manual intervention, definitely, for sure. Anyone else? Oh, that's it, Stuart. Yeah, it's perfect. Um, okay, well, I think I'm the heart of everybody. It's uh, worth giving a round of applause to 